Good morning. Good morning. morning. You're all very welcome. And it's still got a touch of summer about it. It's creeping away from us. However, we're kind of clinging on to it, hoping it won't go too far and that it'll come quite soon again. And there'll be Christmas in between. May I be the first to wish you a very happy Christmas. (laughs) Let us prepare ourselves for our hour of worship, meditation, and prayer. This is the day that we come to pray. This is our sacred space. This is where we join together in love. This is where we pay homage to the divine. We come here hungry, to feed on the words of the Lord. We come thirsty to stretch our imagination on the word love. We come as the faithful. We sing praise together. Amen. And now may we sing together our first hymn, and it's hymn number two, I think I'm right, hymn number two, Lord of all being thrown to far.
Good morning. This is the first Sunday in the new month, and normally the kids' club would be downstairs having fun and games because of COVID. It hasn't happened for two years now. But Sheena has kept it going, has had Zoom meetings every month with them. So thanks, Sheena. <laughs> she has another meeting today with them. <coughs> so I thought maybe today, I imagine the Reverend Chris for their, we're hoping they'll be back in October. In fact, they almost certainly will be back the first Sunday in October. So bring the children with you or borrow the neighbors or something, but get them here. For that service, I'm sure the Reverend Chris will be resurrecting the children's reading, or story rather, uh, which he always did. So I thought I would jump the gun a bit and I would tell you children a story this morning just. This is a story about a church minister. No names. <laughs> I was speaking to him a few months ago and he was full of the joys of spring, very chipper. I couldn't understand why. And he started to tell me that the previous day, the pull cord in his bathroom switch had gone faulty. Now, normally this guy would just say to himself, where on earth did I get an electrician on a Saturday? But no, he said to himself, I wonder could I fix that? So off he went to home base, bought the switch, came back home, turned the electric off, up the steps, and fitted the switch to the bathroom ceiling. He was so proud of himself, he just could not believe what he had just done. And nor, neither could Isabella, sorry, no names, no name. <laughs> neither, neither could the minister's wife. There is obviously a bit of a message in the story. And the, the message would be, if anybody ever asks you to do something, don't say, I can't do that. Just go and try. You never know until you try whether you can do it, and you might just surprise yourself. So you're getting double value. You're getting a story under reading this morning. So the message is the same, by the way, in, in the, the poem. It's called, It Couldn't Be Done. Somebody said that it couldn't be done, but he with a chuckle replied that maybe it couldn't, but he would be one who wouldn't say so till he tried. So he buckled right in with a trace of a grin on his face, if he worried, he hid it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. Somebody scoffed, oh, you'll never do that. At least no one ever has done it. But he took off his coat and he took off his hat, and the first thing we knew, he'd begun it. With a lift of his chin and a bit of a grin, without any doubting or quit it, he started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. There are thousands to tell you it cannot be done. There are thousands to prophesy failure. There are thousands to point out to you one by one the dangers that wait to assail you. But just buckle in with a bit of a grin. Just t take off your coat and go to it. Just start in the sing as you tackle the thing that cannot be done, and you'll do it. Thank you, Charles, for that. And uh, I don't mind outing myself over the light switch because I need to add to that. Isabel and myself have been living in our apartment on uh, the Lisburn Road for 12 years at least, 12 years, say. And there was one door that never properly, properly closed. And last week, I looked at it and I said, I'm sure I could repair that. It took me five minutes. I think, though, I should get an applause for it. It's fixed, and the door is closing properly now. But it's an amazing five minutes it took me, but 12 years to look at it and study it and see exactly. So anybody who wants a little job done around the house, give me a call, and I'll see you in about 10 years. Let us pray. Loving God, 
we call on you for strength and wisdom to help us to achieve high standards in our everyday life, to bless us with the strength to work within our communities, to better our communities. Loving and compassionate God, grant us the understanding of a free religion, a religion of love, one that assumes a spirit of cooperation, of understanding towards others of different faiths, of different groups, of different backgrounds. Help us as individuals to commit ourselves to formulating our own religious belief, not being afraid to think outside of religious orthodoxy. not one that is selfish or conceited, but a belief that not only grows within ourselves, but aids the growth of our community, of our city, of our neighborhoods, of our families. Help us to understand the needs of the world around us. Help us to develop compassion where there is none. Solidarity where it is needed. And communal spirit where it is desired. Amen. And now may we... No, it's not. Choir. Apparently the uh, speakers weren't switched on, so if you find it difficult to hear what was happening this far, we apologise. We've now got to correct it. And maybe we should start the service all over again. <laughs> anyway, it's good to have the choir back, most of them, and we're going to sing a lovely, simple anthem for you, Purify My Heart.
and welcome back, choir. There's been some excellent programmes on BBC4, the television, say BBC4 TV, um, on poetry. And recently there was one on Norman McKay, who I wasn't aware of, to my shame, and it was an excellent program, and I'm going to say a little bit more about him and, a, and some of the people that contributed uh, to this program. But one of his poems really jumped out at me, and I want to read it for you now and then speak a little bit about it later on. And it's called Small Boy. He picked up a pebble and threw it into the sea. And another, and another. He couldn't stop. He wasn't trying to fill the sea. He wasn't trying to empty the beach. He was just throwing away. Nothing else but. Like a kitten playing. He was practicing for the future. When there'll be so many things he'll want to throw away, if only his fingers will unclench and let them go. And now may we sing together our second hymn, hymn number 245, All Things Bright and Beautiful.
I have a modest interest in poetry. I think that would be fair to say, rather than overstate and say that I devour poetry. I have a modest interest in poetry, which occasionally whets my appetite. A poem will pass by and I'll go, wait, come back. I need to see that poem again. I need to read it again and again. For instance, one poem that really captured my imagination was a poem by the American bard Walt Whitman, and particularly the line, Captain, my captain. People will remember it from the uh, famous film, Dead Poet Society. I don't know why that happens, whether it's the rhythm of the poem or whether it's the words that you're in love with. The same is with Michael Longley's poem, Cease Fire. Now, I think in some ways that's quite obvious. It's because it resonates with a moment in all of our lives or maybe even a specific time in our own life. Or in the case of cease fire, it is the reaction in the, to the process before and including the Belfast Agreement, commonly known as the Good Friday Agreement. Longley's poem, Cease Fire, has become an iconic poem from that time. Norman Mackay was a Scottish poet of some renown, but as I must admit, I was not aware of him. However, thanks to the BBC, I was rightly introduced to him by a beautiful programme with the likes of Billy Connolly and a multitude of Scottish poets and musicians. Many of them travelled out to a lake where Norman Mackay would have camped and fished, and they spent overnight there singing about him and talking about him. And like Norman, none of them caught any fish. I don't think that was really the intention of the trip. I learned that Mackay became a reader in poetry at the University of Stirling in 1970. But more importantly, I learned about the nature of, his, of the man and his family links. He had strong connections with the Isle of Harris in the Outer Hebrides. That is where his mother hailed from. His mother could speak Gaelic fluently, but Norman could not. Norman Alexander McCaig, OBE, was not only a poet, but was a great teacher. And his poetry in modern English is known for its humor, its simplicity of language, and its great popularity, not just in Scotland. And when he died in January 1996, Norman McKay was well established as the grand old man of Scottish poetry. As I mentioned, he had been honored with an OBE and the Queen's Medal for Poetry. In the TV program with Billy Connolly, it great, gave us such great insights into his curmudgeonly humor. And I mean that in the best possible way. He had such sardonic wit. He had the face of a Scottish chieftain and the sharp wit of the best storyteller. 
There were many, many noted people in this program reciting his poems as a certain poem might appeal to them. But the one that just jumped out at me, which I read earlier on, small boy, and in particular the last line, which I'll come to naturally at the end of the poem when I read it again, in part. The poem starts with the simple lines, he picked up a pebble and he threw it into the sea and another, and another, he couldn't stop. Now that is the tale of many a small boy, or indeed girl, on the side of the seashore or a lake. Picking up one stone, tossing it into the water, making it skip maybe across the sea. And another, and another and not stopping until someone calls you away. And as the poem states, there was no ulterior motive on behalf of this young boy. No ulterior motive whatsoever. He wasn't trying to fill the sea. He wasn't trying to empty the beach. Nothing like that not trying to reclaim land for man or emptying the beach of its stones to make it sandy. He was just throwing each stone after another. He was just throwing away nothing else but. Now, I'm sure many of you have watched a little puppy or a kitten play, and know it's learning for later times. You can see that. We know that when a little kitten chases after something that you throw, or, or a dog, you know that there's something in that animal that's making it practice or train or learn for, for its future, for its survival. And as Mackay says, like a kitten playing, he was practicing for the future. The little boy was like a kitten playing. He was practicing for the future. Ah, that future. The future for which we need new skills and which promises everybody so much. But alas, again, the words of the poem, when there'll be so many things he'll want to throw away, if only his fingers will unclench and let them go. If only his fingers will unclench and let them go. This could be about any of us, the things that we can't let go whether it is possessions or maybe a great hurt or an accepted handed down, be it religious or political or social, if only our metaphorical things, fingers could let it go, if only his fingers will unclench and let them go. During the week, I attended the trade union rally for the postal workers outside City Hall for old time's sake, or maybe I couldn't let it go. But I couldn't say that to myself. I couldn't let it go. I met some old comrades. I met Andy Kerr, who had traveled over from London to address the rally. Andy is like Norman Mackay, a Scot, and he's Deputy General Secretary of the Communication Workers Union. 
and we chatted and had our photo taken together. And I spoke to many others, some I'd known from the past, from my trade union days, others I just got talking to on the day. These things are always like an outing, really, aren't they? They're about protests, but it's also about seeing people you haven't seen for many years. One lad who I had never met before came up to chat to me. And as we talked, he was like an echo chamber. He was like an echo chamber for all the ills he believed had fallen on his people. His people. No other people, only his people. He had rehearsed, repackaged, regurgitated the tales of woe that his people had suffered. And how they would never forget. And he was determined, absolutely determined, to hold on to that indefinitely. He was not going to let that pass. I despaired, genuinely despaired. And I hoped, if only his fingers will unclench and let them go. Amen. The music for reflection today is a piano solo, but I want to thank all those who kept the music going over the last two months in the absence of the choir, not least in August when I myself was absent. <laughs> Goodness gracious. So thank you very much. We've had sound problems today. You're all hearing me? Yeah. Yes, very good like the rector who got the new amplification system and he was trying it out, wasn't sure that was working very clearly. He said, um, can you all hear me this morning? And the congregation replied, and also with you. <laughs> now Beethoven's second most famous piece of music, you know what the first one is, you know the one that starts da 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 I put in a few extra da da's there. Um, maybe you have it on your phone as a ringtone. <laughs> and the challenge when a, a student learning piano is playing that one for Elise, it's called, is not to make it sound like a ringtone on a on a on a phone. Uh, I'm still working at that one. So I'm today. I'm going to play actually a harder piece. It's Beethoven's second most famous piano piece. It's the one that's been given the title Moonlight, Moonlight Sonata. Uh, actually, Beethoven never gave it that title. It was long after his death. And it's just the first movement we're going to play. It's the famous, very famous movement. Now, there's a problem with this one because it's getting the tempo right, the speed. If it's too quick, Beethoven's syncopations and rhythms don't work. And if it's too slow, it, it, it's marked um, adagio sostenuto, which means slowly and sustained. So it should be slow and sonorous. Uh, but it can become slow and tedious. That's the problem. <laughs> you know the one, don't you? Da di da di da da di da da di da da di. Some people play it like that. You know, you could go off and have your lunch and come back and they're still going, da, da, da. You go off and have your tea and come back, da, da, da. So, a little bit more movement, but without ruining the rhythm in it. So, it's very difficult just to get it right. And we also need these long lines to sing those long phrases. So, here we have the slow opening movement of what's properly known as the Sonata Quasi Fantasia in C-sharp minor, otherwise known as Moonlight.
Now, I have a number of notices, so I'll uh, try and get through them as quickly as I can. First of all, I visited Freddie Moneypenny, who's in hospital, hence the reason you haven't seen Freddie for some time sitting at the back of the church. And he's in great form and making a good recovery, and he sends all his love to all his friends here in All Souls. Also, I want to mention that uh, Reverend Bridget Spain, who is our minister in the Dublin Unitarian Church, that Bridget's husband, Paul, is not well at the moment, and Bridget would ask you all to remember Paul in your prayers. Now, yesterday I attended the installation of Reverend Rosalind Taggart, one of our fellow ministers. Rosalind has moved from Temple Patrick to Downpatrick, and she was installed there yesterday as a minister of Downpatrick. So we wish Rosalind all the best and every blessing from everybody here in All Souls. And welcome back, Trevor. And we want to also, Trevor, to extend to Gar uh, Gareth our sincere thanks for um, being with us for the last few weeks. And also, uh, it's great to have Trevor back, but I'd also like to mention all those who have uh, contributed musically and otherwise to the services uh, during, during the summer, and still do. Brian, who's away at the moment, Francis, who's here with us, uh, Eve, Eve, and Sam, who's away at the moment, uh, Violet, Violina is not here with us this morning, and of course, Muriel. Your contributions were absolutely wonderful, and please, please, Give us some more. Thank you very much. And I want to thank those who record the service every week. Uh, they're often forgotten about sitting there at the back in our highly technical little suite up there in the corner. Today it's Muriel and Alan. Thank you very much. Because when our service goes out every Sunday, I often look at the YouTube to see how many have watched it. And Alan, am I right in thinking anything being between 70, 150, and one time nearly up around 300? So it really is wonderful the amount of people who watch us again on the uh, YouTube channel. So thank you for all your efforts. And Alan. Uh, good afternoon, Good afternoon. sorry everybody. Um, I'm just here with a short notice about our Your Space group. Now the Your Space group has taken a bit of a vacation over the holidays as well, like many of us, but it is back uh, this Thursday, uh, the 8th of September at half past seven. And in the musical theme that we've just been talking about there, uh, the first thing we're going to be doing is watching the Whoopi Goldberg classic of uh, Sister Act. Um, it's not enough that I've already seen it on the West End and have booked tickets to go to see it in the Grand Opera House and will be helping produce it in school. Um, mm -hmm. But we're going to watch another, uh, the version of it here in the church at half past seven this uh, Thursday. So everybody is welcome to come along. Um, there'll be snacks and things as well, so it promises to be a good night. Thank you, Alan. And also I'd like to remember that our book club returns on Wednesday the 21st at 7.30. I can't remember the name of the book, but we'll put it up on the uh, email that goes out with... with uh, you remember it, Isabella? Will you come up and tell people the name of the book? It's called Death and the Penguin, and it's by the Ukrainian author Andrei Karkov. That's right. We purposely, I just remembered, we purposely picked a book by a Ukrainian author because of the circumstances in the Ukraine. So you still plenty of time to read it uh, by Wednesday the 21st. And please come along to the book club at 7.30. And now may we sing together our final hymn, and it's hymn number 342 in the Red Book, 
all my hopes on God is founded. May faith in the spirit of life and hope in the community of earth and love of the sacred in ourselves and others be ours this day and in all the days to come. Amen. God bless you all. Go in peace. <laughs>